Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? Doing well today, Andrew. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm, I'm doing good. Uh, let's go ahead and, and get into it. So this week, uh, as always, we're going to start off with some news items here. Um, I have put in the show notes the output from what we were talking about last week, the service version review script, where we list the, uh, the versions that we are currently running in all of our uh, supported environments, our, our stable branches. I, I guess I'll launch into this because this is something I am actually kind of passionate about. I wanted to, to see, to, to kind of get ourselves on the, the same page here. Anytime a new service gets added, we bump a stable version, a, a minor release at least. Um, now, major versions, according to semantic versioning, uh, it would be anything that breaks backwards compatibility. So if we do anything that breaks, like I think the first break from zero to 1.0 was when we added the ability to extend storage virtually infinitely. But in order to do that, we had to revamp where our Docker volumes were sitting and where they were stored and, and how we stored them. And that broke backwards compatibility. There was no way to make zero dot whatever work with 1.0 and beyond. So we had to keep keep going forward uh, and, and could not maintain backwards compatibility. So in order to indicate that, we bumped a, a full major version. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to say as well is that while some of these are up to date, if you look close enough between master and latest, most of them will be an entire minor version behind. That is because, according to semantic versioning, the highest bug fix version of a minor version receives all the bug fixes while being stable, while not introducing more right. bleeding edge features. So I'm trying to we're trying to balance right. stability here with bug fixes and security. So you're going to see uh, Nextcloud, for instance, the latest release is 19.0.1 whereas we are riding the 18.0 train. Now, if there becomes an 18.1 train, we'll go on that, but we won't upgrade to 19.0 until they create a 19.1. So then we will upgrade to 19.0 and track the bug fix releases from there of 19.0. So yeah. we're, we're keeping one minor version behind what the latest version is. Perfect, yeah. Um... Anything else to add on that? Should I jump into other news Go here? For it. Yeah, so another news here is the Have I Been Pwned code base is being open sourced. Uh, Troy Hunt recently posted a blog article saying he was going to open source his project. I was under the influence, based on kind of what I saw around, that he was only open sourcing part of the code base on GitHub, was my understanding. But um, what I saw is that he's always kind of thought of the project as being open in spirit. Uh, I'll quote it here. A heap of really amazing projects are open source these days. Uh, he said the platform runs on ghost, which is open source. I, as he mentions visual studio code, which I was having some problems with earlier this week, <laughs> but uh, he said that he, it sounds like he use, uses that to develop. And uh, most of the libraries in have I been pwned are open source as well. Um, so, have I been pwned is the password check. It's the, um, is my password all over the internet? Is it super easy and guessable? Is it, it, it checks, uh, it, it's an aggregator of password dumps and, uh, account dumps. Yeah. So it will troll the internet and the dark web for those to anything that's, that's open to the public or even that they've been able to acquire and aggregate them and, and do its magic. That Orton uses the have I been pwned code base to, uh, what is it? You can check all your passwords against this, uh, his collection, his set, his database. Wait, I'm giving him my password? Your password. I'm giving him my password. Why would I do that? No, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. But, uh, pretty, be pretty interesting if you did. <laughs> <laughs> 
it sends your password to have I been pwned as some kind of a hash or whatever. So it, it'll encrypt your password and hash your password before it sends it out. And then it will check to see if your password was in any of those data breaches, right? So it, it sure. will say your password has been pwned because it's been leaked somewhere, right? That's, that's the whole thing that this, this have I been pwned service does for you. It, it tells you whether your password has been pwned or not. Definitely. So uh, I guess everyone out there with a password, uh, password one or Hunter two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> Hunter two. Yeah. You, you might want to go out and change those. <laughs> uh, also in news this week, we have uh, Jitsi meet now on flat hub with this big news is that it's on flat hub. So rather than virtualizing, uh, you know, VM or an OS, this virtualizes the uh, application tree. One of the huge technologies, or one of the major technologies that plays a role in this is OS tree, which is what I saw was mentioned. And uh, it was described as a Git for apps. So something to uh, keep in mind here. I know here at R Compose, we use the Jitsi Meet client. So I am currently running it via the Electron app. Ditto. But Ditto, yep. I will have to check this out using the Flatpak installation. I'm... I'm really not too familiar. I haven't run uh, Flatpak, so it's something I'm probably going to check out. Uh, I might even do it with Jitsi Meet. Yeah, and, and diving into a little bit of, of Flatpak too. I mean, it, it uses the same technology that Docker or other containers do where it uh, it, it implements uh, mount namespaces and uh, PID namespaces mount, yeah, and, it, and, you know, yeah. other, uh, other namespaces as well, C groups and other tech uh, that that's integrated that that allows containers to run uh, it does the same thing for applications in your desktop Flatpak is also innovating in that it is is trying to provide a a os independent uh, installation of applications almost as apple's dmg kind of uh, application in a package like you you literally just have this one zipped file that you can that you can throw on your computer and it, it's 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 huge it's ginormous but it has everything you need to run in it guaranteed it's it's a very stable way to distribute software it doesn't have you don't fall into dependency hell you don't run into a whole bunch of library conflicts while you're trying to install stuff and it's it's just in general very very smooth uh, now, the the actual security and the actual robustness are still being worked on, right? And there are holes, there are gaps, uh, but it is a promising piece of technology. That's that's not alone. Snaps, yeah, yeah. flat packs, and app images are all newcomers to this application like a container ecosystem. So they all have different strengths, different weaknesses, different implementation details, uh, and they're just an evolution of how applications are being developed and deployed and deployed. distributed. Yeah. yeah. Right. So so very interesting, you know, and as we keep talking about servers and services and stuff, keep in the back of your mind. I mean, this isn't the only way these things are being utilized. They are really revolutionizing everything about how we are distributing applications definitely do we want to hop into our composed developments you here want me to talk more do you want to talk on the two two developments yeah yeah sure uh so so to pick up where we left off last week we were talking about how mount namespaces prevent different views into what may seem to be the same directory so i did this week link to the blog post the medium blog post and uh, there is a first blog post that was published in, in 2015, actually, that this Medium blog post kind of reiterates on. And they both have little quirks here and there that I had to adjust. But for the most part, uh, they keep along the same same path where we try to mount a directory into a container and, and we can't, right? It's for, for one reason or another, even if we don't have the permissions to mount from within the container or when we mount from the host, it's not in the correct namespace. So we we aren't able to. What the the method here to do in, in order to mount a file system from the host into the namespace container is to actually use a program called NSEnter, which allows you to basically spawn a shell 
inside of the container, much like a, a Docker exec would, but with elevated privileges that that container does not have. So with those elevated permissions, you're now able to perform that mount. You're now able to see those files on the file system. The, the, the funny workaround here is that the file system that's actually mounted inside of the container is the root file system. So from inside the container, you can see all of the file system on the host operating system. Now, this is a jailbreak es escape, uh, actually. So, so if you were able to do this in a container as an adversary, you would now have access to all of the files in the, the host, system. host system. Yeah, you can start and stop services. You can run arbitrary code. You can start uh, data mining, attacking, snooping, whatever, right? But in this case, we want to do it for a legitimate reason. So we, we mount the base mount point. Then we bound mount the specific directory that we want with the sp specific file permissions into the container that we want it in. And then we unmount the root file system. And even while unmounting the root file system, we still maintain that bind mount that was established earlier. Now, all this is done with NSN or with those elevated permissions, but at that point, the container's still running with uh, non-elevated permissions. So, Privileges, so we're, right. we, we still maintain that security posture where we're not running a permissioned container in production. We're actually running a very, very secure container in production and we were just able to, as admins, go in and do exactly what we needed to. Uh, so this is this is a very, very intricate way of making files available inside a container that wouldn't be otherwise, especially while the container's running. Um, and that has led us to be able to do stuff like what we're doing with distributing our, our, po our podcast now and, and our podcast sites and what will eventually be the rest of our sites, right? So the the services that we're hosting right now are going to undergo a significant speed boost because instead of having to go all the way back to the back end docker container and have your you know http requests go through all the various servers and networks the virtual servers and networks inside of the the host os before it actually comes out it will hit the very first service and that service will say wait a second uh, that specific thing is an image. I don't have to go all the way back to the server because it doesn't need to compute anything. I just need that image. Um, turns out we can right. bind mount those images into the, the front end server and it can just serve it right to you super quick. So I am, I am anticipating a huge speed boost for all the services that we provide uh, given that um, also looking at some Nginx uh, efficiency boosts as well. But but that alone should save a lot of processing power, should provide a lot of save time in, in, uh, in network traffic as well. Yeah, we're cutting out uh, basically an entire step of the process there for static assets. So huge speed improvement, like you said. Do you want to talk about the uh, improvement we have this yeah, week, so, the other development? So, so this I actually uh, implemented last night, two nights ago, something like that. Now this this was interesting because the way we do server migrations, well, our, our our kind of security posture here is that we are continually migrating these these servers, right? So we are provisioning a bare bones, clean, up to date server and transferring all of our services onto that server, and then wiping away the old one that maybe hasn't been updated in a week or two or whatever. So we want to make sure that we're on the latest and greatest stable while maintaining your data and your information that should follow you because it is just a, a service you expect to have available. So that being our, our posture, we do migrations a lot. While migrating, we have to spin up the database backend uh, that is on all of the servers in order to load the data from the previous instance in there. What we were doing before was running all of this setup, including spinning up all of the services, loading the old data, and then reinstantiating all of the services. Um, specifically, what I ran into with uh, Bookstack actually was a a bolded, italicized sentence in the documentation that says, when doing a server migration, loaded the data into the server before instantiating the database, 
Which is okay. fine enough okay. in a typical migration, but that's not how we had this coded to work. Done it before, exactly. Right, right. So what I had to do is rejigger what we had in the code in order to split it up into basically a skeleton install and then a full install where it installed only the front end and the back end, uh, which would be the, the front end Nginx proxy and the, the back end MariaDB database, and then load all the data into the database and then come back and re uh, come back and, and, and instantiate the services. We would the yeah, initially yeah. instantiate the services there. We would that would be the first time that we're spinning them up instead of the second time. Which if we did that, as I found out, it broke. Just breaks the data. Yeah, yeah, it breaks the data. Well, it's yeah, uh, and and it's running a migration when the database is instantiated. So if the migration had already, yeah. <laughs> You're, you're shaking like your head, that. yeah. That's a, that just doesn't sound yeah, good. No. no, yeah, no, I am shaking my head. That does not sound like a fun time <laughs> trying to migrate data onto something that's trying to be in stage. Exactly. So, so w- we're trying to create a table that we're trying to move data into a table that's being created. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what we do is we front load all the data into the database. Then we spin up all the services, present them with the, the data that's already in the database. They know what version they're at and they can continue the migrations from there. Um, that's been especially helpful, especially migrating to uh, newer versions of services, especially minor versions where they need to run those, those data database migrations so awesome with that should we hop into our integration discussion i see we got a twofer here can board initial configuration i see next cloud we do i i didn't want to slight any of our other services because they they offer boards as well i mean it it doesn't seem fair to to exclude next cloud when we're talking about kanban boards just because it it's not specifically designed for that use case right off the bat i mean it does have a fully fledged application that's actually been been pushed and, and hit 1.0 recently and i think it's it's a really well done implementation and i wanted to give that a f- fair shake as well uh, and then and then go through the the differences between that what i wanted to touch on with camboard was the initial configuration we've had several overview episodes where we've gone over what something is and and how we use it and what we think is most important and and getting a holistic high level view of what that is now it's time at least for camboard to dive into how do we get started using it. We wanted to get the details that would give us the ability to hit the ground running. So I laid out what I think are the most important things, first steps in order to configure a Camboard instance, specifically a Camboard project. So this is getting going from scratch. And the first thing I wanted to touch on, again, following up from last week, were the columns and states, right? So I walked through the setup, where to go to get to where the columns are and what you can do with the columns. So the columns, you can change their names, you can delete them, you can edit them, you can add some, and, and, and that's really all you need to do with them. There's not a whole lot of configuration. Obviously, the biggest part of this is the configuration. So it's like, what columns do I even need, right? How do I want to track this? The basic way to start off with this is to figure out how to configure your, your columns. What columns do you have? So, so I give a couple of different workflows, and I know we touched on some of these as possibilities, but I really wanted to break down how they could work. As we were talking about last episode, the most basic of states are to do, doing, and done. Those are the basic three states, right? That's, that's a fine setup in and of itself. However, adding a couple of states makes the workflow much more flexible and robust. My recommended setup for any general board, if and this fits a lot, a lot of workflows as we'll go over, but, but in general, this is what I would say. Um, we start off with a backlog. Then I have a planned column. These are tasks that have been prioritized and I know I have planned to do these. The next column would be the in progress column, the things that I'm currently doing. From from there, it becomes a little bit more off in the weeds. So I have I have the, the, the initial idea phase in the backlog, then I migrate it to something that I know I wanna do in the planned state, and then I bring it to in progress where I'm actually doing it. When I'm actually doing it, there are a couple states it could be in besides me actually sitting down and working on something or, or it waiting for me to sit down and work on it. Uh, it could be waiting in some kind of response from someone else or, or some kind of follow-up that I need to perform. The next column is is the review or the testing column. So this is after I've gone back and forth with people and I'm ready to to review or test this. The second to last column after that is the 
pending uh, column, the one I like to call the time activated column. I think that sums it up better than anything. These are typically set aside for events where an event would occur on a specific date or at a specific time. If I don't want to see that in my in progress because I, I can't do anything until that time, right? If I have a concert that I'm going to, right? I'm going to throw it in the pending column because that concert is until next Saturday. I can't do anything until next Saturday. And then the last column is the done column. Now, this is the most rewarding column because when stuff gets put into the done column and then you come back the next day and maybe it wasn't a great morning or maybe you're just like super groggy and you're looking to get some pep, it's great to go back and say, look what I accomplished in the past week. Look what I look what I did, right? Um, now we, we do a little special something with our done column. We actually have it so that uh, it can board tracks the days a specific task has been in that done column and once it reaches 20 days it closes out that task which hides it from the default view uh, which is which is perfect because i want that to be around so that i can review it uh, when when jack and i get together for our review meetings right we go through everything that's in that done column we say all right what's been there for less than 14 days and because we, we do review meetings every two weeks and, and we go over that, we, we see what's been done. A couple other uh, configuration options I wanted to go over, um, for instance, for like a CRM or, or a sales pipeline, right? If you think of from left to right, you know, as we're setting up these columns, what would be applicable for all of these various scenarios, right? Initial contact or, or like uh, outreach or or a, a brand new lead a brand new customer brand new someone right um, and then what what would be different between that and then someone who's who signed on who's who's behind your project 100 percent but is the first time that they're going through the process of, of working with you of having a relationship with you and then how is that going to be different from someone who's done this before and you know who you're trying to maintain a relationship with right are there similarities throughout the process for all three of those states and i would say yes and i would say you can track them all uh, in in this kind of general workflow so you have a you have a backlog a backlog of sales leads a backlog of of work to be done of of you know relationships to be maintained if i you know make a point of calling someone quarterly that's going to be that's going to be something that I, I have in there waiting, ready to go. Then the next column would be our initial contact. You know, something's got to kick this off, whether it's a, me reaching out to someone, someone uh, emailing me, um, whether it's, you know, it, a, any one of those. You're going to have that initial contact and and trying to document or develop, you know, what what's the need here? Right. How, how can I help? You know, what what's the problem? Where can we fit in? Uh, and then once that's done, uh, there there could be another column in in a consultation or or requirement documentation and and a kind of general negotiation, tr trying to feel out you know what we can do, how we can help, and and what are the details, how what do we need to get to, you know, can we get on the same page in this, and can I provide something that's going to meet your need, right? Um, if if we continue past that, then you're on to the development phase. Seeing as this is just a relationship board, I'm just going to call it a development phase. So you're going to develop what you develop, how you develop it, maybe use your other boards to start developing stuff internally that's fine uh, but as far as your customers concerned you're developing something for them once leaving that column would would put your task into a, a demo column or, or almost an acceptance testing column where you say all right here's what we've uh, come up with what we're able to provide does this meet your needs uh, does this need refinement you know how can we make this better for you is this something you're going to be able to work with and back and forth? And, and I actually foresee, you know, a lot of going back and forth between that development and an acceptance testing column. Second to last, you're going to put it in a delivery column, whether that's um, you needing to deploy it to them or, or deliver it to them and, and, and build them for that and, and kind of finalize all the details of that transaction. Um, or, or even just to follow up and say, hey, you know what, this is, you know, you, you've been with us. A year right let's give you a, a annual discount or something like that right so you're gonna you're gonna put that through for them once that's done you get the satisfaction of moving it to the very last column the close column and and you can see how that could be applied to all stages of the life cycle whether it's a brand new customer someone who you're working with for the first time or someone who's uh, been established in your ecosystem for a while and I think that's that's a, a, a good Concept to use. Obviously, any of these can be tweaked 
if you don't need the time activated column, then don't use it, right? If you don't need the development column, if you can go straight from from a customer uh, saying that he wants something to you delivering it, get rid of the development column. That, that's fine. Um, these are these are at the these are at the whim of the people who use them. Obviously, a system is only going to be as good as if you're using it. If it's not conducive to you using it, or if it doesn't make sense for your specific application, then change it. Absolutely, make it make sense for you. So these are once again just examples. I think you covered it pretty well. Uh, the one thing I note it's the difference between uh, review and waiting is external versus internal. Cool. All right. Well, do we want to hop into uh, rows and swim lanes next? Yeah, this this All this right. one's fun. Uh, rows that are colloquially known as swim lanes are used to break up the tasks on the board in one of several ways. There's there's once again no set way to do this. This is entirely up to whatever makes sense for the business. These should be used to indicate priority, with the higher priority towards the top. This is this is purely visual. the The other thing is don't use these to split up tasks by assignee. That's what the assignees and other filters are for. Swim lanes are for stuff that cannot be indicated by that. So the most basic swim lane setup, as we went through before, from top to bottom would be uh, having the, the, the critical tasks in the top swim lane and then literally everything else in the bottom. Um, and like I said before, this, this allows for us to immediately get ourselves in the habit of indicating something being critical and something being not and not having everything be critical all the time. There's a setup that, that Jack and I use that I think has worked out very well uh, that splits it into four swim lanes. Uh, one being critical at the very top, the next one being incidents, the third one maintenance, and the fourth improvements. To define those, anything that's a bug or an issue or a problem, anything that's a one-off solution, right, would go in the incident column. That would be the, the one right below critical, right? The swim lane right below that, the maintenance swim lane, that's a, that's a swim lane that should house all of the repetitive work. Everything else goes into the improvement swim lane. To kind of back off that granular design, there's, there's also another way people try to take it, which is you can categorize your swim lanes by visibility. Um, so, you know, to, to wrap that up, and, th and that was a fairly short segment, but to wrap that up, swim lanes are the most efficient way to categorize tasks on a board according to priority or type of object uh, or, or subject type of subject uh, but i would caution against using them to indicate things that other aspects of the task are meant to indicate like categories or due dates <laughs> so having having gone over camboard uh, i i think that's a that's a good enough initial configuration that'll get you set up with your 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 columns and your rows right and and give you a better idea of how to set that up now there, there might even be room for another episode of how we do categories and tags and assignees and uh, additional actions that Kanban is, is able to perform, but that will get you started. The next thing I wanted to go over was deck. Well, and, and, and this is almost a comparison between the two. I mean, uh, unashamedly a comparison between the two of them. This is a application uh, that can be installed in Nextcloud and it has its complementary mobile app and and the entire ecosystem behind it and it works very well with the internals of Nextcloud as well. So Deck similarly is a Kanban style organizational tool aimed at personal planning and project organization for teams. With Deck, you can add your tasks to cards and put them in order. You can write down additional notes in Markdown, obviously a programmer's favorite markup language. You can assign labels for even better organization, similarly to categories or tags. You can share with your team, friends, or family, basically whoever else is on Nextcloud. And I think that's a big thing, right? Especially if you're already using Nextcloud for any of its other integrations. This is something that you can just put right on top of it as well. Uh, you can attach files and embed them in your description. You can discuss with your team using the comment system, uh, which is ultimately important. You, you definitely want to have comments on these these tasks, whether in Camboard or, or in Deck. Uh, you can keep track of changes in the activity stream, like it will give you a live feed of exactly who's done what to what when. Uh, and then get your project organized, which is what we're trying to do in the first place. We're trying to organize our projects. And, and that's what Deck allows us to do, very, very similar to, to Camboard. So but I did want to mention what Deck has and even more notably what Deck does not have. Deck 
has a subset of features that Canboard has. Uh, it has the following features in no particular order. It has titles, assignees, attachments, due dates, tags, descriptions, and comments. That's a great baseline. Now, it does notably lack a couple of the features when compared to Canboard that Canboard has, namely automated actions, internal and external links, and subtasks. Um, however, like I sum it up here, for, for the most basic of workflows, it would be more than sufficient. And I think the one major benefit is the uh, integration, obviously, with Nextcloud. All right, getting into our grab bag this week, uh, I want to present Docker. So last week we talked about containers and a little bit of what they are and how they work using, um, what is it, our C groups and our namespaces. But this week I kind of wanted to dive more into Docker, which is a little bit a little bit prettier, I'd say, than, uh, the raw, than in the raw. Um, kind of jumping in. It starts with our images in our containers. I'd really just say it starts at a Docker file. That's the easiest way to explain it. Uh, basically, you build a file called name. That was the weirdest design Docker decision. File. They're just like, yeah, and we're just going to call it Docker file no matter what. This is Docker, and we're going to call it <laughs> Docker file. This is how you d design dependencies and pick everything that's going in. A Docker file is basically a way to describe how to assemble the private file system for a container and describe the metadata on how to run a container, build an image. Getting into it a little bit, when I think of a Docker, building a Docker image, there are a few things that immediately jump to my mind. Syntax, the uh, co yeah. a copy keyword, run, expose, and command. Basically, these are the main things. The, the big note is what I'd say here from Alpine is that Alpine image. If you take a look at this thing, I think it's, it's crazy what this image is. Most ISOs you look at for Linux are, I'd say they'd run about 800 meg to a gig, but this Alpine image is 130 no, that's a, megabytes. Is that? It's smaller than that. I guarantee you it's, well, oh, I'm sorry. Compressed. So, it's smaller so I than see, that. I see, I so, see. So, okay, so, okay, so right here, I'm reading it off. It says a container requires no more than eight megabytes and a minimal disk installation okay, requires yeah. around 130. Yep. So I was just going off of the uh, minimal. But the actual the actual container itself, the actual container is 8 megs. What? 8. Yeah. Compressed. Yeah. So that's that's awesome if you think about storage and space. Yeah. And, and actually there are different OSs too. So like Red Hat makes their UBI image. Um, and they do a lot of tips and tricks. They're just little, little workarounds to get those smaller like you don't even have yum installed on the ubi it's like this yum-esque stripped down installer thing um ubuntu has a really small one as well so so there are other os's it's not just alpine but right so yeah you can load up a ram uh ram disk vol what is it volatile memory with this thing and slap it on a pc and boot from that which is pretty crazy to think about but it's possible <laughs> Um, so these keywords, uh, basically kind of just get it real quick. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on them cause I want to spend, uh, more how we kind of built a rails image, how I kind of built a rails image and how we use multi-stage deploys, but quickly going over these, you have your image, your base image, you have your copy command to basically move files from your current host system or from wherever into the container. You have your run commands, which would basically be for, uh, I often use it for installing packages on the container. Uh, I have an expo the expose command is used for ports. If you need to expose a port, if you're running a service, and then the CMD or command command uh, is how I'll describe it is uh, what you use to, it's the last step you run to run your runtime environment. I mean, so, so the command is, that's the process that you were talking about with the PID namespacing, right? That's, that's that's the process that runs. So, like, whether it's Apache Correct. or whether it's a another server, uh, usually it's it's going to be the thing that runs. Right. It's a uh, so most of the time it's an entry point shell script is what we kind of see around. But it's there's no doubt we can see uh, we have seen some where it's just a one liner and as well. So that can actually be overridden. And I do that for Jekyll, at least. So I override the command with an entry point. And I, I run that entry, entry point script that sets up 
whatever we need to set up and then it runs whatever was in the command. So we're still keeping the upstream command, but I'm kind of inserting my own little bit of, of commands in there in a shell script. Yeah, exactly. Just kind of squeezing it right in there and saying, hey, actually, before you run, could you do this? So you get this Docker file. You build your Docker file. It's just a file you would look at uh, in Vim or VS Code or whatever you use. So you have this Docker file in uh, text editor. It's nothing special except a bunch of text on this page. What you, you can run is a Docker build command to build your image. So once you've built it, you can actually push it up to a registry and that image is now located on a registry. So once it's on that registry where anyone, uh, I should say, with access or permissions to that registry is able to pull down that image and run that image in a runtime environment, which would be our container. The one thing I'd compare images to is artifacts. Basically, it's everything bundled up, all your files, everything you need is bundled up and kind of stored and contained for your runtime environment. So just a few quick concepts here and kind of the uh, really just the benefits of some features of Docker are the storage features and networking. I'm just kind of briefly blow through them here, uh, kind of talk about them. Uh, we've mentioned volumes and mind mounts. Uh, Andrew mentioned today how we use bind mounts and NS enter to actually cut out the middleman here for our uh, web services in our asset pipeline. So the main benefit of volume is sharing data among multiple containers. Uh, I kind of say the main benefit of bind mounts is sharing configuration files from the host machine to the container. A little bit about what we talked about earlier. And then the one the one other uh, type of storage that there's out there I haven't used, but I'm actually, I'd be interested to try out is this temp FS. To, so it's, I assume it's temp file storage. Uh, mount. So it's when you don't want your data to be persistent on the host or the container, but maybe you need it for security reasons or to protect performance. So this basically loads your volume into RAM, into volatile memory for faster read write. Something I want to say about volumes and mount by mounts. Volumes are able to be managed by Docker. Docker is able to create them to destroy them, et cetera, et cetera. But they can only live within a specific directory that Docker knows about and that Docker controls. If you're mounting into containers from any other point on the host operating system, you're going to be using bind mounts. It may look like the same command, especially in a Docker compose file, but under the hood, those are actually going to be bind mounts and not volumes. Getting into the quick networking here, we have user-defined bridge networks. The main benefit or one the use case uh, is when you need to use multiple containers to communicate on the same Docker host. We have host networks which are best used when the network stack should be isolated from the Docker host, but you want other aspects of the container to be isolated. Then we have overlay networks, which are best when you need containers running on different Docker hosts to communicate or when multiple applications work together using swarm services. Yeah, so a, a little bit about how we use it. We spin up one VM with, uh, per, uh, I'd say, a large amount of resources usually. Uh, it kind of depends on what, what, you, what you want, what you use. I know we have some instances out there that are four gigs and uh, four CPU, four gigs and two CPUs, four gigs and four CPUs, or, you know, most of them, some of them out there we have that are one gig and one CPU. It, it ends up being just fine. We're able to run all these services. Uh, and we aren't, in, we're not, we aren't, we don't really run into any performance problems because nothing's really hogging the system at one time is what I'd say. With that, we also get reproducibility. We're able to just blow away VMs and spin up new ones and deploy services and migrate very easily. So with our front end service, our Nginx at runs as a reverse proxy, we're able to run all our services at subfolders and just point the service subfolder to a Docker service. So we're able to proxy back requests from a given subfolder. So if you run it from uh, rcompose.com slash nextcloud, you'll hit our nextcloud instance. rcompose.com slash canboard, you'll hit the canboard instance. When behind the, and these instances are basically the services that are running as containers. And when you hit portal, you actually run into the service that, that we maintain, which is our kind of uh, management service that, that Jack's been writing up here. So yeah, in and he's been developing, he developed this from scratch in, in a container native ecosystem so yeah oh it's so nice i'll tell you what rails deploys are a nightmare at least from my experience trying to get some trying to get a handful uh capistrano's the uh leading way to deploy but i'm telling you we got our container 
we got our image built and uh, our containers are, we haven't really had any problems with them. So I'm really excited about that. But kind of hopping into pipelines, image building images and pipelines, I have linked here in the show notes our Rails example Docker file. We are able to use GitLab pipelines to build it on every commit to master or to any branch. And we're able to check, did the build succeed or did it fail? If it failed, we can go back and look. We're able to use the image in a way that makes, whenever we run our compositional role or our migrations, we're immediately, we, we almost immediately know whether it's going to work or not. We can point to a latest image and say, okay, this is the, what I have being built. This is how it should be run. And it sh it's going to run that way across any environment. We're able to easily point out where we go wrong. So, I mean, how, how, is this, how has this saved you? The big example for me is, especially getting this set up for the first time, was assets. Uh, you kind of talked on them for our Jekyll site, but it's a little bit different in our rail on command center and portal, the way assets are built. Node and NPM and Webpacker and Rails are not fun. They don't play nice together. They're trying to make them, everyone's trying to make them play nice together, but they don't. So there were a handful of times when we ran into issues where we'd have a web server serving requests, but you'd hit the site and none of the like pictures wouldn't render nothing would render on the front end none of the css was there none of the style was there everything looked like crap but it worked <laughs> so so this this is for me at least this is an easy way to say did the assets build and are we able to run the image in a container and check it out at you know port whatever port 3000 is what we usually run rails at and say okay it's working and we can move forward from there kind of branching off our assets and, and getting into uh, slimming down images. I have had so many problems with images that are like a gig, a gig and a half. Basically, I have that Rails image building now is with builders. And it's this weird concept to think about. But basically what you're able to do is you're able to store the binaries and the bare minimum of what you need. And you can run from that. You can run from your bare minimum. So what you're saying is what it takes to build is a lot larger than what it takes to run. Correct. So what I've done is if you check it out, if you check out that file, basically the first 80 lines there are build requirements to build to build that image, which is fine, which is it's it's a required step, no doubt. The assets need to be compiled. And so we use this uh, as builder syntax and then... We can kind of jump down and our run, and we can redefine what we want for our runtime environment, and only install the services we need, only install the binaries we need, expose our port, and then deploy. So, how much does this save us by? So by we went doing from that? like I think at our max it was 1.8 gigs. I think it's down. I want to say I saw something at 240 meg recently, nine times thinner. I would check out multi multi stage builds. They are a little complicated and complex, and you don't need them in every environment or for every image you build but if you're going to build complex images i'd highly recommend them you really just need to understand that the container is what you need at runtime there's no need to have you know all that bloat on the uh, container if you're not going to use it thank you for going over that jack we hope you enjoyed this episode of our compose cast thank you be safe and we'll see you all in two weeks